the um, Yamak after the turn of the year. And then I'm going to go in to the beginning of something or another, just to start it off. And then we'll stop and we can have a discussion about everything that we've looked at this week and last week. And then the plan is to go, uh, I'm hoping today, at least to get to the transition to being in itself and being for other. Um, so we'll look at something, something another, and move into being in itself and being for other. And then, so for next time, um, I suspect that we probably won't get as far as Hegel's account of infinity, um, but if you could look at the account of being in itself, being for other, determination, constitution, and limit, that would be really good. I mean, if you're if you're chugging along quite happily and, and making progress, and can read into uh, Hegel's account of finding you, that would be good. Um, the section on the limitation of the or is pretty difficult, and I think it is almost inconceivable that we'll get to that next week. So if you wanted to stop at that point, uh, that would be uh, that would be fine. Um, I'm sorry not to be able to give you um, more detailed instructions. I've never been able to do that. I've been teaching for you know uh, almost well, well over well over 30 years, but uh, somehow I've never been able to manage because. To, to tell you exactly what we're going to be do, able to do every single minute of every single hour. Um, so I'm sorry about that, but, but it's important to have a bit of flexibility depending on uh, discussions and so on. All right. Um, okay, so the logic, Hegel's logic. Um, well, at my reading at least, and I think this is shared by quite a lot of people, uh, the logic is both a logic and a metaphysics. Indeed, Hegel credits Kant with turning metaphysics into logic, which doesn't mean getting rid of metaphysics altogether. It means that metaphysics now gets carried out via logic. And remember that although we think of Kant as being critical of metaphysics, he's only critical of a certain kind of metaphysics. The whole point of Kant's critique is to establish the possibility of metaphysics as a science. So, so for Kant too, the analytic of understanding um, is the ground of uh, a critically informed metaphysics. Anyway, so that's so... I think that's the way I read the logic. That means that the logic is an account both of the basic determinations of thought and of the basic determinations of being at one and the same time. And it proceeds, I argue, by rendering explicit what's implicit in the category of pure being. So the task, then, is, as we go through the logic, to determine what is the logic of each specific category. And what the logic of each specific category makes necessary. So what we need to understand is where, as it were, given that we're not leaving space, where the logic of a specific category takes us. And I hope you've already seen um, in the difference between the way that becoming emerges and the way that determinant being emerges, is that there isn't a single pattern that is observed at every stage of the logic. Although there are very established commentators, people like Michael Forster, who think there should be. Either they think there is, which is pretty difficult to establish, or they think there should be, and so they rewrite Hegel's logic in order to fit what they take to be the established pattern. Uh, it seems to me, why would you, if the method is imminent to the material at hand, why would you expect there to be a single universal method? Um, I mean, there's certain things in common, I guess, but um, but I'm interested in the specificities of each particular stage and what moves us from sort of A to B to C to D. Right. We began, as you know, with um, Hegel's account of pure being, which he argues, but because of its indeterminacy, vanishes into nothing, which because of its sheer immediacy vanishes back into being, and that vanishing he names becoming. So you have you have to really think of those three uh, together. I'm not going to go over that again in detail because we've already done that, and I think you're now in a position to think about that uh, on your own. Um, becoming then settles into the unity of being and nothing, a unity that Hegel calls Dasein, or determinate being, or being there, it's sometimes translated as. This is somewhat more difficult as a transition, and of course leads to the opposite conclusion from the original analysis of being, where being gave rise to becoming, vanishing. What happens with becoming itself is that that vanishing itself vanishes, disappears. This occurs 
because the vanishing of being and nothing into one another undermines the very difference between them and so leads them to settle into their stable unity. That's basically what's going on. And the thing to understand here is that the initial vanishing of each into one another, which is constitutive of becoming, actually preserves the very difference that it undermines. Obviously, insofar as being and nothing vanish into one another, their difference is being overcome, and, and Hegel makes this quite clear at the, um, uh, at the uh, beginning of the paragraph on becoming, where he says pure being and pure nothing are therefore the same. The, the difference vanishes insofar as one just proves to be the other. And yet, by virtue of the fact that one proves to be the other, and that they can't coexist because the one is the vanishedness of the other, that in fact their difference is preserved in the very vanishing of that difference. So, the, so Hegel's conclusion here, he says in the, uh, in the section on sublation of becoming, that this structure is contradictory because it isn't properly what it is. The vanishing of each into one another isn't, in fact, the vanishing of the two. So what takes us then onto the next category is simply rendering explicit what that genuine vanishing is. And Hegel argues that to understand that vanishing as the vanishing of the difference between being and nothing, then they, that their immediacy must be lost. Their immediacy must vanish. But that means they must collapse into a unity in which neither is immediately what it is. Remember again, in becoming as such, which is the vanishing of being into nothing into being into nothing, their purity and immediacy vanishes only to pop back up again. That's why I've said, provocatively perhaps and not so slightly unfairly, that, 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 that from that point of view, Heraclitus, as it were, clings on to being Parmenides because it's only by clinging on to the purity of being that you get that vanishing in the first place. But if you really think through what that vanishing involves, namely the vanishing of the difference between the two moments, then the vanishing itself ceases because they settle into uh, a unity. That means they no longer vanish into one another, but they vanish into their having vanished, their verschwunden sein, their unity. That unity is one in which, however, something has genuinely vanished, namely the purity and immediacy of each. That has now gone. The difference between being and nothing hasn't gone completely, but the immediate difference has gone because they are now bound together. Okay, sorry about that. As I said to you, we'll have a lot of fun with that next term in the aesthetics. The way this goes off, yeah. on and off. Um, okay, also got to. Um, all right, so that I, 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 we looked at that. I'm not going to go over that again. But when we get a break for the discussion, if you want to come back to this, I'm, I'm happy to do that. Okay, so we are now with Hegel's account of Dasein. I will just again briefly go over that. Um, and for this, uh, I, I drew up on the board. It seems to me it's actually um, helpful just to have a little image of what's going on here. So if we have, just for sake of argument, we have being and nothing going into uh, one another, they settle into uh, Dasein, where Dasein now is uh, being plus the negative, where the negative, however, is itself inseparable from being. So you can think of being as inseparable from the negative, and the negative inseparable from being. So that's that's why he begins uh, the account of, of, uh, of Dasein um, by saying the determinate being uh, is a being with a non-being, such that this non-being is taken up into simple unity with being. So that's the basic structure. And the way that Hegel uh, progresses through the logic of Dasein is really just a matter of sort of highlighting, in a sense, or shining a light on the affirmative and the negative moments um, in order to do justice to both. And here you see the process of rendering explicit really most clearly. 
Um, if you think of Dasein as simply being that's one with non-being, well, fine, that's what it is. But that doesn't do, do justice to the fact that it's being as one with non-being. Um, it's a little bit like, and I had hasty about only a little bit like, um, I think Heidegger in, is it? Oh, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Maybe, are you doing a survey? In the essay on the principle of sufficient reason, uh, I think Heidegger he takes a sentence from, um, is it Angelius Silesius? Um, uh, is it nichts is ohne warum? Nothing is without a why. And Heidegger highlights the fact that you can go, uh, nothing is, or nothing is without, that's right, nothing is without a why, or nothing is without a why. You can sort of highlight the negative or, or the positive in that, and he does sort of work with that, seeing that subtle difference within that one sentence. Well, there's a little bit of that going on here. Dasein is being, that's one with non-being, but then we've also got to think of it as non-being that is one with being. And that's not just an insignificant difference that you can completely overlook. So I'm going to write that as non-being that is. That is not a different determination. That's just, as it were, the other side of Dasein. Um, non-being, however, Hegel has already said in the paragraph uh, at the top of page 110, it's the second main paragraph in determinate being in general, that this moment of non-being is determinacy, bestimmtheit. So non-being that is, is determinacy that is. And that is a rather awkward translation of Hegel's expression, Zion der Bestimmtheit. So what we move on to is the thought of desire der Bestimmtheit, which is sort of impossible to translate. Um, and that is the determin and this comes in in, um, in the section on quality, the second paragraph. In the middle it says determinateness that's isolated by itself in the form of being is quality. So determinateness in the form of being is Zion der Bestimmtheit, which is just basically determinacy that is. And he names that quality. So Dasein, determinate being, is quality. So the logic so far is saying that to that being can't just be being, it's got to be becoming, it can't just be becoming, it's got to be Dasein, and as such, it's quality. And of course, the first thing to note about that is that quality is derived without any things to which the quality attach, uh, uh, attaches. So quality is not always the quality of something. And again, I might have indicated last week, but if I didn't, I'll say it now, that Hegel's procedure is somewhat reminiscent of Spinoza rather than Aristotle, in that Spinoza too will begin with what you might call something more universal, substance, and then show how that substance particularizes and individuates itself in its modes. Uh, whereas with Aristotle, you, know, you, get, you get the idea that, or at least a certain Aristotle anyway, that, that, that individuals are f fundamental, and then properties belong to those individuals. And you see the same thing coming later in Frege, for example, as well, where you know what there really is, as it were, are individual things, and then uh, properties belong uh, to them. That's not how Hegel is proceeding. All right, so you might think, well, we haven't got very far there, but we, we've got a little bit of the way. Um, all right, what he now does then is again highlight the fact that this term itself can be understood in two ways with two different emphases, as non-being that is, and as non-being that is. That generates the difference between negation and reality. So negation and reality are just quality with those two different accents. And the accent, accent is Hegel's word. He uses that word. And so you get... Um, this giving rise then to negation and reality, both of which have the same fundamental structure of non-being or determinacy that is, 
but one of which has a negative accent and one of which has an affirmative accent. And that is where the logic of Dasein sort of reaches its conclusion. So, and then if you look back, you say, okay, well, Dasein is the unity of being and non-being. It's being with a non-being, but it's not just that. It's also non-being with is, but that itself has a twofold emphasis to it. It's non-being. It's non-being with is, and it's non-being with is. Okay, what more is there to emphasize? Well, for many, well there isn't, you've, you've done justice to all the elements. That's it then you see where that, that goes. So this is not an endlessly repeatable uh, um, move. And indeed, that is, having just said that, that is a fundamental point about uh, Hegel. Until we get to certain structures like the bad infinite, which is endlessly repeatable, many of these structures aren't endlessly repeatable. They have a certain dynamic, a certain logic that gets you to a result, and then you're onto something uh, uh, different. Okay, now, um, again, this is going over, I think I explained all this last time, but this is just to make sure that it's clear in your head. Um, just one thing to note, um, that if you're working with the Miller, as I don't know some of you are, uh, the wording in the important paragraph, third paragraph under quality, is um, slightly mistaken. So I'm just going to, um, so the, I'll, I'll show you which bit I have in mind. So, Hegel's just introduced the idea of quality, and he goes on and says, determinate being, however, in which nothing no less than being is contained, is itself the criterion for the one-sidedness of quality as a determinateness which is only immediate or only in the form of being. Because remember, quality is determinateness, non-being, in the form of being. But of course it's also non-being, so... It contains itself the criterion for its own one-sidedness. It is equally to be posited in the determination of nothing, and this is what it should be, whereby then the immediate or affirmative determinedness is posited as a differentiated, reflected determinedness. Womit dann die unmittelbare oder seiende Bestimmtheit als eine unterschiedene, reflektierte Gesetz wird. Uh, Miller kind of loses sight of that in saying that it will be posited as a differentiated, reflected determinedness. It is equally to be posited in the determination of nothing when it will be posited um, as if somehow being posited in, the determin in a negative determination itself constitutes the reflected moment. That's not what he's getting at. The point is that Quality by itself, before you think of this, is just non-being that is. Quality. When, however, the moment of non-being is accented, and so we get negation, this retrospectively changes that. And so, when quality is thought of as non-being that is, that changes the status of non-being that is because it makes it one side of a contrast, whereas initially it isn't. Initially, it's just quality. But the moment that negation is thought, then that quality, as it were, by contrast, gets to be thought of as reality. And that's what he means by a um, differentiated, reflective determinateness. His point is that once negation is thought, then the immediate affirmative determinateness, non-being that is, comes to be posited as a differentiated, reflected determinedness. Reflected, very, very simply, what Hegel means by the term reflected is if you have sort of bounced off something else. So to be immediately X is just to be X. To be X in a reflected way is to be X via something else. And of course, reality, quality gets thought of as reality via the idea of negation. It's not a hugely important point because what we end up with is the distinction and that's what's crucial here. But just when you're reading the text, if you're reading that in the Miller thinking what on earth is going on, well Miller is not giving you actually what is going on. So, okay, so we have then Dasein, which is quality, qualitative being, which gives a name, gives a name to the whole of this section. 
you know, this quality, quantity, and measure, itself takes the form of the difference between reality and negation. And as I think I might have mentioned last time, this is the first determinate difference we have in the logic. A determinate difference that doesn't vanish. And then you can look back at the difference between being and nothing and think, well, that was a different kind of difference. That was an immediate difference that by virtue of its immediacy vanished because it wasn't determinate yet. Now we have a determinate difference that doesn't vanish. And it doesn't vanish because it's constituted by different terms. Reality and negation. And interestingly, what enables it not to vanish is in fact that it, in the fact that it is a difference between two determinations that share the same logical structure. Whereas being and nothing aren't like that. Being and nothing are absolutely distinct. Being, pure being, that's it. Nothing, pure nothing, that's it. Each vanishes into its opposite, but they don't, as it were, share a description, because of course, there isn't a description that fits them both. Whereas here there is a logical determination that both exhibit, and they are two different forms of, of quality. So you would think that would mean, OK, well, surely this is the point at which there are, isn't really a difference. No, this is the point at which there is a determinate difference. Now, I put the line there because it's just the, the marker I use to indicate determinate difference, where determinate difference is this, not that. And so reality is reality, not negation. Negation, obviously, is negation, not reality. OK, um, now, Hegel goes on then in the last paragraph to draw out another implication of the fact that they're both forms of quality, and that is that each, in fact, is contained in the other. Because each, because they share the same basic logical structure. So he says, both are determined of being, but in reality it's quality with the accent, again, emittive accent, on being. The fact is concealed that it contains determinateness and therefore negation. Consequently, reality is given the value only of something positive, from which negation, limitation, and deficiency are excluded. Uh, and again, I think I said last time that that, so what Hegel's doing here is both showing that reality and negation are bound up with one another, but also explaining why we think that's not the case. It's not as an error on our part. It's as if the very structure of reality itself presents itself as one side, as just purely reality, although it is in fact, or does in fact conceal within it the moment of negation. Because it is a form of determinate being, a form of non-being. So reality, a positive quality, reality in reality doesn't mean you know, everything that there is. <laughs> okay, it's not the sum total of all there is. It just means positive quality. You know, which can be specified further as, you know, being red, or being big, or whatever it happens to be. Reality is just a positive quality. Um, it contains the moment of non-being within it. Negation, on the other hand, taken as mere deficiency, would be a nothing, but it is a determined being, a Dasein. And so uh, it's a quality only determined with a non-being. So negation also has an affirmative moment to it. So reality is affirmative concealing a moment of negation. Negation is negative, obviously, concealing an affirm affirmative moment. And that means that negation is not just a lack. And this is where people get unhappy with Hegel. Because it means that not being X is a constitutive positive feature of being Something. Now, we haven't got something yet, but when we do have something, and something is determinate, it's not being such and such will be part of it. As opposed to what you might say is a more normal view, that a negation is just some kind of lack. <coughs> that chair you know, lacks being blue. Yeah, well, obviously. You know, it, it, it just doesn't have blue in it anywhere. At least in my eyesight, it doesn't anyway. Um, and a lot of people think, well, that's just something that sort of doesn't belong to it. 
But that's not Hegel's view. That can't be Hegel's view. Negation here is a form of quality, but it's a negative quality. A negative quality which itself has an affirmative aspect to it. This will become important later on, as we'll see, because it means that negation is constitutive of what it is to be uh, in various different ways. All right. Um, that's it. You can see the section on Dasein is very, is very short. There's not, there's not really any more uh, to say. Um, but there are some interesting things in the remark. Um, and I just want to bring out uh, one particular point uh, in, 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 in the remark. I'm not going to read all of it. Um, okay, uh, the remark begins with a paragraph, reality may seem. Uh, if you could look at the second paragraph, uh, it's page 112. I think it's 86, 87 in the, um, uh, in the Digivani. Hegel writes, in connection with the term reality, mention must be made of the former metaphysical conception of God, which in particular formed the basis of the so-called ontological proof of the existence of God. God was defined as the sum total of all realities, the ends are elicited. And of this sum total, it was said that no contradiction was contained in it, that none of the realities cancelled any other, for a reality is to be taken only as a perfection, as an affirmative being which contains no negation. Hence, the realities are not opposed to one another and do not contradict one another. Reality is thus conceived, is assumed to survive when all negation has been thought away, but to do this is to do away with all determinateness. Reality is quality, determinate being. Consequently, it contains the moment of the negative and is through this alone the determinate being that it is. So reality can't be purely real. Because it's determinate. And as determinate, it has the moment of non-being, uh, which itself takes the form of negation. All right, so if you can then skip the from then towards, uh, and move on towards the end of the, uh, the paragraph. Top of page 113 in the middle. Hegel writes, when reality taken as a determinate quality, as it is in the said definition of God, is extended beyond its determinateness, it ceases to be a reality and becomes abstract being. We sort of will flip back to the beginning of the logic. God, as the pure reality in all realities, or as the sum total of all realities, is just as devoid of, de of determinateness and content as the empty absolute in which all is one. Okay, so if you take the moment of determinacy and negation out of reality, and you deprive God of all negation, you effectively reduce God back to pure being. But what happens to pure being? Well, it proves to be nothing. So this is what he says at the end of the following paragraph. The said reality in all realities, the being in all determinate being, which is supposed to express the concept of God, is nothing else than abstract being, which is the same as nothing. So it's really interesting at this point to compare uh, uh, Hegel with Nietzsche. Because, of course, Nietzsche also wants to think of God the metaphysical God, as, as nothing, as the negation, as, as, as the simple not of everything that life is. Only Nietzsche has a very different story about how we get there, whereas Hegel is a purely conceptual one. Namely that reality, affirmative positive quality, is a form of determinateness and therefore involves non-being, which is expressed as negation. And if you extract that moment of determinacy and non-being negation from being, you effectively reduce being back down again to pure being, which is just nothing. So the ens realissimum, even though the metaphysicians may have thought, not thought that, was in fact, well, there are two options. Either it's nothing, so Nietzsche's right, I mean, for reasons other than he thought, or they're not really being honest and they're not really depriving the end realism of all negation. As indeed I would <coughs> say is actually happening with Parmenides. Parmenides is not really thinking pure being because he's marking it off against nothing. And so in fact Parmenides' pure being is not nothing. And so it is in a way determinate being. 
If it were pure being, it would vanish into nothing. And so one could say that about the ends of simon. It's either nothing, or it's not really um, pure reality. Hegel doesn't make a lot more of this, um, although he does in his own philosophy of religion, he draws the obvious conclusion from this, that God must include negation within itself, in the form of death, for example. But what you see here is the way in which Hegel can use various concepts that emerge in the logic to then look back at other philosophers and criticize them. You know, you'll have to judge whether it's accurate or not. But you should look out for that throughout the whole course of the logic. It's not just, it is a process of developing logical determinations. But at various points throughout the logic, Hegel will draw on those determinations to look back at Kant or Spinoza or Leibniz or whoever it is, Fichte, in order to develop a logical critique of the way that those philosophers think. And it seems to me that we can still do that today. I mean, it's what I tried to do in my thesis, you know, 40 years ago, what it was, um, on Nietzsche, Hegel and Nietzsche, by looking at Nietzsche's thinking I suppose not in a way that Nietzsche would be very happy with, but in terms of the categories and the concepts that, in fact, underlie the sort of thinking that he does. Um, and it seems to me that it's it's something that you could also think about. Um, it is, if you're looking for a use for the logic, that is uh, uh, one of them. The other thing, of course, you might also discover is that there are actually structures and other thinking, other thinkers that are very close to what Hegel's thinking. It's not all going to be negative. Uh, all right. That's all I want to say about uh, Dasein. Um, okay, I want to just get us in now to something, and then um, we will have a, a, a pause, and you can have an opportunity to talk about this. All right, so um, the next concept that arises is something. Ekvas. Ekvas, remember, for Kant, is the minimal concept. So everything we've been looking at so far falls below what Kant thinks is the lowest concept you can have. There's something or there's nothing. But being, for example, isn't a concept uh, for, um, uh, for Kant. It's the positing of the thing. There is no concept of being, strictly speaking. I suppose it's articulated in the is of a, of a judgment, but there isn't a concept of being, strictly speaking. And being determinate is itself always attached to being something. But for Hegel, we've got to get to the very thought of something. So how does he do it? Well, he does it by noting at the beginning of the section on something, which is on page 114, 115, uh, immediately after the remark, that the difference between reality and negation is a difference that doesn't vanish but it is sublated. It's a difference which, in being a difference, also proves not to be a difference. So not a difference that vanishes altogether, but it's a difference which, in being a difference, also proves not to be a difference. And I suppose there are two ways of looking at this. First of all, reality and negation are two forms of quality. So in the difference between reality and negation, quality relates to itself. But also, in fact, in the difference between reality and negation, since each is concealed in the other, each moment relates to itself. Reality relates to itself in negation, because negation conceals reality within it. And negation relates to itself in reality, because reality conceals negation within it. So the difference between the two sides of determinate being collapses, Hegel thinks, into one self-relation. A self-relation between moments that are nonetheless different. So again, this is a different kind of move than we saw from becoming to Dasein. In the move from becoming to Dasein, the difference that generated becoming vanished. Here, the difference that is constitutive of Dasein doesn't vanish. It's overcome, it's sublated, while being preserved. 
The thought of something, then, for Hegel, is simply the thought of self-relating determinate being. Being, determinate being that relates to itself in its difference from itself. So, quality differentiates itself into negation of reality, and in so doing just relates to itself. And it's that moment of self-relation that is constitutive of being something. And as I'll try and highlight in what's coming, this is really important. If determinacy is marked by this, not that, that moment of contrast, reality, not negation, negation, not reality, something, being something, is marked by being self-related, by having an identity, although that doesn't come in later, of its own. And in fact, Hegel even notes at one point that being something is having a sort of a, 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 a dimension of ownness to it. Once we've got the idea of something, we've really got the sort of three basic, I hesitate to use the word tool, but the three basic concepts that you're going to need for the rest of the logic. Immediate difference, which is vanishing. Determinate difference, which is always uh, always cons uh, consists in two sides of a, of, of a contrast. This, not that. And self-relation, which we see first of all in something and then in other, comes back again in being for self uh, and in being infinite, uh, and, and we'll see it later in the concept as well. Okay, now I'm just giving you a sketch to begin with before we look at it in detail. One thing I want to say, though, just to avoid confusion, and as, in, as always, I don't want to create confusion in trying to avoid it, so I'm going to try to uh, not do that. Hegel's point is not that there is Dasein, and yeah. there was being, which proves to be Dasein, and that Dasein now proves to be a something. Because that would mean that being is a something. And that's not what he's claiming. He's not claiming at this point that, well, by the way, there is something out there called Dasein. Like an absolute, a spirit. His claim is that <coughs> Dasein, or being determinate, proves to be being something. To be determinate amounts to being something. You can't, therefore, just be determinate without being something, although we have to derive being something from being determinate. In fact, you can sort of see the whole logic as being a sort of a, 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 a series of, um, of conceptions of what it is to be. To be is to be, to be nothing, to be determinate, to be something, to be other. To be finite, to be infinite, to be quantitative, to have a measure, and so on and so on. All right, let's uh, let's look then at the um, at the uh, Hegel's um, first comment, his derivation of uh, of something, and then the first few things he says about it. Um, okay, so again, the first thought is that uh, Dasein, which has generated this difference, this first determinate difference. is also the relationship of quality to quality. It's the relationship in which that difference is also undermined then. So, does that involves a difference, but a difference that is also not just a difference, but a single self-relation. See the first paragraph under something after the um, remark. Indeterminate being, this is 114 in... Um, uh, and I think it's 88, is it, in the uh, Digimon? In determinate being, its determinateness has been distinguished as quality. We've seen that. In quality is determinately present, Dasein. There is distinction of reality and negation. Note that italicizing. There is distinction. We don't lose that. Now, although these distinctions are present in determinate being, they are no less equally void and sublated. Reality itself contains negation, is determinate being, not indeterminate abstract being. Similarly, negation is determinate being, not the supposedly abstract nothing, 
but posited here as it is in itself, as affirmatively present, as Sein, belonging to the sphere of determinate being. Thus quality is completely unseparated from determinate being, which is simply determinate qualitative being. He goes on to note, though, that we're not just, so we're reverting back. It's not like having got to this difference, we're just reverting back to there again and sort of forgetting the difference altogether. You could say, okay, well, exactly you're doing, Hegel. You're showing that Dasein generates a difference and you're just forgetting the difference and going back to there again. No. The difference is, as you just said, there is the distinction. So the new unity that's established is established in and through this difference. Something, which hasn't yet been named, but which is sort of coming, is self-relating quality, quality that relates to itself in its difference. But here, we haven't got a difference yet. So we're not going back. That means that the unity of Dasein is a unity that he says um, involves Dasein becoming again equal to itself. Now, again is meant to indicate that it's not a reversion to where we were before. It's actually a word that, if you read it properly, it does the work it's supposed to do. If you don't read it properly, it's completely misleading. If you think that again just means repeating where we already were, that's not what it means. It means that Dasein was unified, became differentiated, and now is again unified, but unified in a new way that it was never unified in the first place. So quality then, through this difference inherent in inherent in determined being, becomes again equal to itself in its difference. It relates to itself in its eternal, internal difference. And it's that, he then says, that constitutes Dasein as something. So this is what he's saying in the next paragraph. This sublating of the distinction is more than a mere taking back an external omission of it again. That taking back an external omission would just get us back to Dasein. It's not that. It's more than a simple return to the simple beginning to Dasein as such. The distinction cannot be omitted, for it is, again, italicized. What is, therefore, is in, what, the, what is, therefore, in fact, present, now read what follows those words as a sequence that summarizes the movement that we've just gone through. What is, therefore, in fact, present is determinate being in general, Dasein, where we started. Distinction in it the difference between reality and negation, and the sublation of this distinction. Determinate being not as devoid of distinction as at first, but as again equal to itself through sublation of the distinction. The simple oneness of determinate being resulting from this sublation. So the, the self-relation that we're coming to, the new unity we're coming to, is a result of the self-undermining of the distinction between reality and negation. We're not going back to the beginning, we're coming to a result. This sublatedness of the distinction, the distinction not just being a distinction, is being's own determinateness. I'll come back to that sentence in a minute. It is thus being within self. Determinate being is a determinate being. Daseindus. As he calls it. Something, at best. There isn't an A there, it's just something. Okay, so what is what is it to be something? And how is being something different from being determined? Well, you see this in the spell out in the next uh, sentence, the first sentence of the next paragraph. Something is the first negation of negation, a simple self-relation in the form of being. Sein der Beziehung auf sich. We'll come back to negation of negation in a minute, 
Just focus on the idea of self-relation in the form of being. Einfacher sein der Beziehung auf sich. In what way is something a relation to itself? Well, it's a relation to itself because it's constituted by the very structure of self-relation. It's the fact that quality relates to itself in differentiating itself to, into reality and negation that constitutes being something. You've got to get the nuance right here. Hegel's claim is not that there is something, and by the way, that something relates to itself. The claim is that being something means relating to self, or relating to self constitutes being something. There isn't a something before the relating to self. Being something is in the self-relating. So if you're asking, well, what is it that relates to itself? It's not something. Not something that relates to itself. It's quality. It's reality. It's negation. It's Dasein that relates to itself. And as such, therefore, is something. Putting it in a different way, I suppose you could say something is not that which relates to itself, but is the very process of self-relating. Hegel calls this structure being within self, in sich sein. And it's the first of a whole set of terms that Hegel coins uh, using preposition. In sich sein, an sich sein, für sich sein, an für sich sein, a whole lot of them. And the distinctions matter, and they're not always observed by Miller or Di Giovanni. And you have to watch that. This is the structure, I think, I think Miller actually does get this. Yeah, Miller says, being within self. And that strikes me as being quite a good translation. It's not being in itself, it's not anti-side. It's being within self in that it's the first form of being to have, as it were, a within. Pure being has no within because it's utterly indeterminate. It doesn't make any sense to say that what is within being or within nothing because it's not a space within which there can be anything. It's just sheer indeterminate being. But then the aspects, the two sides of determinate being, don't, although each contains the other, concealed within it. In fact, the structure of each is not such that each is explicitly up within. Explicitly, each is a being this, not that. Each is one side of a difference. But in this sign is not one side of a difference. It's a relation to self, which constitutes a space of internality. And so the in sich captures that perfectly. Now we have a form of being which has, as it were, an inside, a space of interiority. And Hegel names that something. So any something, chair, pen, human being, whatever it is, as something has this structure of self-relation. And the only thing that can be less than that is being determinate or simply being, which is just nothing as a verb. Okay, now I said I would say a little bit about this idea of the sublatedness of the distinction is determinate being's own determinateness. Because it seems to me, although I might be overreading this, that there's an ambiguity in that. The sublatedness of the distinction is determinate being's own determinateness. The more obvious reading of that, I guess, is to say that the very sublating of the distinction is generated and determined, and, and determined by Dasein itself. Dasein produces the distinction, and Dasein overcomes the distinction. In that sense, the sublatedness the overcoming of the distinction between reality and negation is Dasein's own determinants. It belongs to Dasein. It's not brought about by anything else. Nothing else does it. The only thing at work generating something is Dasein. But maybe there's another way, another sort of nuance in this. 
which is that the sublatedness of the distinction is determinate beings, determinacy of being something of its own. It's determinate beings coming into its own. Even if that's not exactly what Hegel means in that sentence, it's certainly what you're getting here. So another way of understanding Inzigsein is that it is the structure of being something of its own. Being an itself. Now, we don't normally think of this level of abstraction. But for Hegel, pure being is not yet an itself. We can describe it in that way, but it isn't in terms of its own structure and itself. But nor are negation and reality, strictly speaking, themselves. Nor is each an itself. You only have an itself when you have the structure of self-relation, which generates a space of ownness. Now, if, you're, if you think this is perhaps sounding a little bit sort of anthropomorphic, you know, I'm almost, almost getting to the point where I'm thinking of this as a self. Well, absolutely. In fact, when you go into the next paragraph, it's not that it's anthropomorphic, it's that Hegel thinks that the structure of being a self or a subject is anticipated here. So, I don't, I don't want to read the whole of this next paragraph, um, but it's sort of, you know, uh, like about sort of 15 lines or so down, I guess. In, in, uh, in the Miller, you can see subject italicized. The negative of the negative is as something, only the beginning of the subject. But it is the beginning of the subject. So what you get with being something as it is the promise of subjectivity in one sense. So being a subject, beings like us, that are self-conscious for ourselves, self-relating, is prefigured in this. Or in anything, ultimately. So you get, I guess, um, I'm not going to say. You, you, there isn't a sharp divide, as there is for some philosophers, between behavior, between the sort of inanimate, the animate, and the self-conscious, because the very structure of being self-conscious is, or yeah, I'll get there. Okay, sorry. Is already um, with uh, there with with or it's, Sorry, it's not already. There. It's it's already beginning, as it were, with uh, with uh, Inzigsein. All right. So, just again, because um, I want to say a little bit about negation and negation, I want to say a bit about the other, and then we will have a little, uh, then we'll have a break. Um, to picture this, I mean, it's obviously crude and slightly dark, but nonetheless, um, think about being a nothing as being utterly unrelated. Each is just immediately itself, it vanishes into the other, but otherwise there's no relation. Think about reality and negation as being two sides of a difference. But think about something and other, which we haven't arrived yet, by the way, but nonetheless, as having a self-relation of their own. You get three different kinds of difference. Immediate difference, determinate difference, and what you might call separateness, apartness. And they're not the same. And so something isn't to be understood as one side of a difference with the other. It stands apart from the other. It needs the other, but it stands apart from it. Um, all right, a couple of, uh, if you can bear with me on this. Um, negation of the negation. Why the negation of the negation? Well, negation is here, obviously. Negation, as such, is one side of a difference. It is this, not that. It's contrasted with reality. Something, because it's minimally determinate being, is minimally negation. Remember that. To be something, if it is to be determinate, must involve negation. But is being something reducible to that? Well, clearly not. No. It has a structure of self-relation. These two don't. So something is negation that's not just negation. It's the negation of negation. Being something consists in not just being 
negative. And not just being real for that matter either. So you might say, well, okay, being the negation of the negation isn't perhaps terribly helpful, but Hegel's forced into this. If determinate being involves negation, and being something is self-relating determinacy, being something must be self-relating negation. Whatever that might prove to be, this in fact is also the key to why there is another. Because just as before we could see Dasein with an accent on the affirmative and an accent on the negative, so something has an accent on the affirmative and an accent on the negative. And so the other is the same structure as something, only with the negative moment uh, highlighted. I'll say a little bit about that. Now, this is really crucial, because it means that being other is being self-relating. It's explicitly being the negation of the negation. Being other is not just being negation. To be other than is not just to be not that. Not that. You are other than is to have a self-relating structure which sets you apart from something else. Whereas being the negation of something binds you to that other as not it. So negation, if you like, connects through distinguishing, whereas something and other initially at least stand apart. That's why Hegel, but not only Hegel, also various French philosophers in the 20th century, can think of the other as just the other, by itself, the other as such. You can't really think about negation as such, because negation is always a moment of a contrast, but you can think of the other as such. But that doesn't mean to say there is no negation in that or in something. There is negation there, but the one is just not reducible to the other. <clears throat> OK, um, I think that might, uh, because I'll come back to this uh, in a Well, I suggest now, let's have a short break, and then come back, and then have a discussion about what you think about all of this. And then if there's time, I'll carry on with, uh, with something or another and, uh, and go on. So um, it's five past, so let's have a short break at this point.